Sony have just announced an incredible new camera, the A7R5. And as the owner of an A7R3, I am so tempted to upgrade to this camera. But after careful consideration, I have decided not to. And I don't think you should either. Here's why. Hi, I'm Rick. I'm a filmmaker and photographer from the UK, and I make videos about photography and filmmaking. So in this video, I'm breaking down the pros and cons of upgrading from the R3, or maybe if you're an R4 owner from the R4 to this new camera, the R5. I've had this R3 for nearly four years. I got it in about January 2018. And whilst I'm, I'm happy with it, I'm absolutely delighted with the images that come from it. There are some things about it that bother me and I'll get onto them in a bit. But I was as intrigued as everyone else by this new release. Some of the features that that camera has got really, really appealed to me. Unlike many photographers and filmmakers, I am massively drawn to shiny new things. So firstly, I'm gonna to touch on the positives as I see it of the A7R5. And I'm sure you've seen the videos out there, but there are so many things that this camera has to offer. It's got a brand new screen that flips in every direction, which is a combination of the kind of the flippy screen on this and the tilty, turny screen that's on the S3 that I'm using to film with now. And being able to manipulate your screen in any direction is brilliant. There are so many times when I've used this that I've wanted the functionality of the S3. And there were so many times when I've used the S3 where I just wanted to flip it up on the back of the camera like that. And because you've got to pull it all the way out, you just you just can't do that. So for this camera to have both of those options is a really big thing. And just the improvement on the screen as well, I'll touch on this in a bit, but it looks like a fantastic camera to use from that perspective, the quality of the screen is incredible. It's got a ridiculous megapixel count, 61 megapixels I think it is. It's got brilliant new AI based focusing modes which just look incredible and will just mean that you don't miss focus as often with this camera. It also has improved in-body image stabilization which will basically enable you to use longer exposures whilst you're hand holding your camera meaning you hopefully don't need to get your tripod out quite so often. I believe the menu modes have also been improved. The menu modes on this weren't great and they've now matched it with the a7s3 and Possibly the biggest draw for me is the improvement in video modes. There is now 422 10-bit color. There's 4K in up to 60 frames per second. Um, but it's mainly the color modes that I'm interested in and the upgrade to 422. Now there are some drawbacks that I can see with the A7R5 and they are price, price, and price. It's 4,000 pounds in the UK. It's a staggering amount of money to spend on a camera. I remember when I first got my 5D Mark II and thinking that spending 1,500 pounds on a camera was a lot of money, four grand, four grand. But other than that, I don't think there are that many negative points to it. Having not used one, I can't fully comment, but from everything I can see from a specs point of view, it absolutely hits the mark. When I come to upgrade my cameras, the main thing I wanna do is look at my existing cameras and Try and pinpoint the drawbacks. What are the things that are wrong with those pieces of equipment that are leading me to want to upgrade? Try and take the emotion of, I want a new thing out of it. Look at your existing equipment first. And that's what I've done with my Sony a7R 3 Now the main drawback I've had with this camera is, is the quality of the screen and the EVF as well. Considering Sony make screens and have made screens for a long, long time. The quality of the screens in these cameras is shocking. <laughs> it's honestly, it's so bad. You cannot tell when you're blowing something out or when some blacks are crushed just by looking at the screen. You've really got to rely on that histogram. And yeah, you could argue that you're supposed to do that anyway. That is photography. You should always pay attention to your histogram. But there's a real disparity from what you see on the screen and what you see when you get it back into your, your computer back home. And that is just down to the limitations of the screen. And also for focusing, when you kind of punch in and you try and fine tune your focus on something, you're second guessing yourself as to whether it's sharp or not because of the limitations of the screen. And the EVF isn't a lot better. And when you compare its cameras that were released at a similar time, this was 
quite a shock to me actually the quality of this screen and thankfully they've improved it greatly in the S3 and even more so in the new R5 and I'd say that's my number one gripe with this camera because I quite often don't trust I just don't trust what I'm getting out of it all the time and I seem to bracket a lot more than I need to when I'm taking shots or taking a, a higher exposure, a medium exposure and a lower exposure to make sure that my dynamic range is sufficient enough to cover the entire scene. But most of the time I just don't need to have done that because the camera is good enough. The screen is telling you something completely different. And then there's the limitations of the, the flippy screen. So if for example, I'm shooting low or high, it's quite good in, in landscape mode because I can just flip it up or I can flip it like that and I can easily see it. But if I turn it round, it's just limited to that. I can't do that or that. And if I'm up high or down low, that's quite a limitation. And uh, I've always struggled a little bit with that. And then from my point of view, given that a lot of my work is filmmaking, the video capabilities of this feel so dated now. It is 420 8-bit color. Um, which means you've not got that much wiggle room when you're in post-production. And trying to match the color from this to the color from my S3 is so, so difficult. And I feel like to be able to do that, I'm reducing the quality of what I get out of my S3 to match it with this. And that doesn't feel right. I don't want to be doing that. I want this to match that. I don't want that to match this. Something else that's always irks me with this camera is the autofocus and in video mode. This camera wants to hunt for autofocus in video mode quite a lot. So if you've got a locked off shot and you've not put it in manual focus mode, you've left it in autofocus mode. With this, no problem at all, it'll just stick. With this, it hunts in and out all the time and it's really, really irritating. So I don't want to use this for video at all because of the focusing issues and because of the color issues as well. The S3 is a much better camera as far as both of those is concerned, which is why I bought the S3. Whilst you're here, if you wouldn't mind liking this video, that would help me out a lot. And if you are enjoying what I'm talking about, please consider subscribing as well. Now, taking all those considerations into account, I am still so, so tempted by the R5 and seeing some of the content out there that's been created by top photographers just makes me want it even more. The things that camera can do are incredible, but you've got to remember this is this is marketing. A lot of these photographers are on Sony's roster. They're getting paid to try and sell this camera for Sony. And that's that's just how marketing works. Obviously that's what they're they're going to be doing, but I'm willing to bet that every single photo you see that has been created on the A7R5 could also have been created on the R3. The dynamic range between the sensors is exactly the same. I think companies now have hit their limit with dynamic range. It's 15 stops of dynamic range for stills. Yes, it's got a greater resolution, but this has still got, I can't remember if it's 41 or 44 megapixels, which is more than enough unless you are putting things on billboards and stuff. And let's be honest, who's who's doing that these days? This, for stills, is an amazing camera. 15 stops of dynamic range and 41 megapixels. I don't really think you need much more than that, especially as a landscape photographer. As a landscape photographer, the focus modes aren't going to really help you out at all. Yes, they might help for sports or portrait modes and stuff like that, but even so, it's it's... It's a bit of help. It's not gonna completely elevate your photography to the extent you'd expect when you're spending that much money. You can get one of these now for a thousand pounds. A thousand pounds for a camera that creates images as good as this one does is an absolute steal. Spending an extra three on the R5, I can't get my head around why you do that unless it's for the video modes. And that's where my difficulty is at the moment. My issues are when I go out shooting is I'm constantly swapping between the S3 and the R3. I'm using the S3 for video because it's amazing at video. And I'm using the R3 for stills because it's amazing at stills. The S3 is only 12 megapixels. So for stills, not great. And I've already mentioned the video on this guy here. Having or being able to have a camera that can do both to the degree that I want them to do 
that's why I'm sorely tempted by this camera because at the moment I often have one camera in my bag, one camera out of my bag and if I want to take video and stills of a similar scene I've got to juggle both. Having one camera on my Peak Design capture clip that I can confidently shoot stills and video with would be an absolute game changer for the things that I could create and for being a reactive outdoor photographer. I was tempted for a while by the a7 IV, not the R4, but the 4, which I think came out is earlier this year or last year. That has got video capabilities to match the S3 or near enough. It's not got the same low light stuff. I mean, the R5 hasn't got the same low light capabilities as well. So getting rid of this isn't an option. But I didn't want to drop from 40 odd megapixels to 24 megapixels, which is why I didn't do it. I should probably mention as well that the A7R5 has got 8K video, which this hasn't got. I mean, that's just ridiculous because the 4K files out of this are big enough, but 8K is insane. I, I don't think I'd really use that video mode. The only way I can see myself using 8K is if I really wanted to punch in on something. So say I'm, at the longest focal length I've got. Say I'm at 200 mil and I'm filming a scene. If I'm filming at 8K, I can then in post punch into 4K and effectively zoom in even further than my equipment would have allowed when I was there filming. That's the only way I think I would end up using 8K. And given that I'm going to Antarctica in 18 months, that might be quite useful. Ah! I have been for a while considering buying a second video camera because I think having those extra video capabilities and another camera would be really helpful to me. And that is why this camera is so tempting, but I'm, I'm just, I honestly, I'm struggling so much with the thought of spending 4,000 pounds on, on a camera. It's so much money, it's so much money. So yeah, it's difficult for me, but if you, like I say, are a landscape outdoor photographer, it's not worth the upgrade. Honestly, it's not worth the upgrade from the a7R3. If it's not worth the upgrade from the a7R3, it's definitely not worth the upgrade from the a7R4. For now, <laughs> this is what I'm sticking with. We'll see how the video creation side of it, and see how annoyed I get. I can feel that the temptation will build but focusing on it, no pun intended, from a primarily stills point of view, you're better off sticking with the R3. Appreciate each and every one of you that's watched this video. Until next time, 